everybody in YouTube land. This video is going to be about restoring, fully restoring a Macintosh SE30. This one I paid uh, pretty much half market value for. It came up on eBay as non-working, unknown. It's in very good condition with almost no yellowing whatsoever. And very low hours because you could just barely see the burn in. And, you know, usually these things are burned in pretty heavily if they've been on for a long time. So, anyways, um, I got this at half market value. I took a gamble on it because the SE30 that I have is really yellowed. And actually, the backstory behind it was... It started life off of as an SE. When I was in high school, I don't know, about 12 years ago, the SE was laying in the back of the IT networking closet. So, lonely little SE. And this was before I even got into collecting vintage computers at all. Uh, I've had these machines before that, but I try, I've got them just to use them, learn about them. And when I've exhausted all their possibilities for the time period, which was 97, 98, 99, I got rid of all of them. But then the nostalgia started to kick in in 2003 or so, which is when I found the SE. While well, the SE was all fine and dandy, but dumbass me tried to plug a new bus card into the SE's logic board. And as you can imagine, that didn't end well for the logic board or the new bus card. <laughs> So it's dead. So I went on eBay and found an SE30 logic board. Mind you, this is circa 2003, 2004. I found a logic board for, you know, 10 bucks. And this was just before the capacitor started leaking. The sound was weak and I didn't get to recapping it until about 2006-ish, roughly, 2007. And that's before the capacitors really started taking their toll on the logic boards. But anyway, I digress. The SE started life off as an SE, then it went to an SE30, then the case was really yellowed and it was an SE case. So a buddy of mine sold me an SE30 case, which is still pretty badly yellowed, and, and that's the same it's been ever since. Now, the reason why I wanted to try to find another one is that I'm not getting into the retro bright community. It's just something I don't want to mess with and I don't want to do. So I found this one. Uh, about half of market price on eBay of today because it was an unknown condition. Uh, it had the Seam C Mac um, pattern on it, which actually that's what the the term is coined. But in reality, the stripes and dots and dashes you see in the screen that seem to be the same on just about all the models is actually the default state that the VRAM is in when it powers up without initialization. So different brands have different. Um, patterns some of them the ti memory have the waterfall matrixy effect and the nec memory have the jail bar stripe effect going this way and then there's different there's different ones for different um you know memory types but so anyways uh and the reason why it's it, i took a big gamble is because now these days you have issues with the capacitors completely destroying the logic board because they've sat so long. It's only going to get worse as the years go by and the possibility of a battery explosion. So, so I, I bought it in pretense just to get the case, pretty much. All I wanted was the case. But when I took it apart, you'd be happy to know that the logic board did not suffer any battery damage. It did not have the Maxell bomb in it. It actually had a... Uh, a Saft brand or something, a white and green one, and uh, it was actually fairly, fairly good. You know, as far as the way it looked, it wasn't you know exploded or anything like that. But I'm sure the battery's long since dead because it was from 1989. Now, um, so I took the logic board out, took it apart, took the bucket apart, did a quick inspection, just just a quick inspection, and then, and then it sat for a couple of weeks. So I took the logic board out. And I noticed again right away that the UE8, which seems to get it the worst, is pretty bad. And it was worse than this 
because the first thing I did immediately when I received the machine was take it apart, make sure the battery was out of it, and, and then it didn't leak, so thank God for that, and I uh, washed the motherboard in the dishwasher. Yeah, I do that, and only just to get the capacitor goo out of the board, and as soon as the washing was done, I had the oven ready at about 185 degrees Fahrenheit, just under the boiling point of water to let the board dry out for about 15, 20 minutes. And this is the result. The bad capacitors literally just fell off the board. I didn't even have to do any desoldering whatsoever. But I will have to clean these up because there's some bad corrosion down in there. So there's possibility that circuit traces are broken in here. But anyways, the reason why I want to work on this logic board is because even though I've already got a working SC30, I'm probably going to, I'm going to fully restore this SC30. Then I'm going to move my logic board in this one because it was, it has the less capacitor damage of all SC30s out there. And this board will go in the other case and I will sell the other SC30 as working to uh, recover my costs. Uh, because it's very, it's not very common to get an SC30 in working condition these days. But anyway, so... That's the logic board. There's no serious damage as far as I can tell. Just your typical corrosion from capacitor disasters. So chances are that the UE8 is going to have to be replaced because they just do. And the reason why is when these things have got capacitor electrolyte laying all over it and you try to power it up, it just shorts everything out. It doesn't go bad by sitting, it goes bad by people plugging it in. So, and the sound amplifier, which is right here, is in pretty pretty bad condition too. Yeah, I mean, look at that. I don't, I don't know if the internal speaker is going to work properly or not. We will have to um, play that one by ear. If not, a TL071 is a very common op amp. And those are your 3904, 3906. Actually, this is a MMBTA 56, and this is an MMBTA 06. So I can just replace that. No big deal. Um, and then that should be it. Now, obviously, I have to replace this and replace this, you know, and get all that fun stuff going. So that's the logic board in a nutshell. I'll go ahead and put it in the box and get it out of the way because we need to the desk space here or the kitchen table electronics repair space to do a quick inspection of this. Uh, all right, nothing stands out as far as any serious or major um, failures here. I have not tempted to power this machine up since I purchased it. And I just want to go in and do a, a full restoration before I do that. Uh, it has the typical 40 megabyte Quantum Pro drive, which these things are notorious. I've done a video years ago about the actuator arm sticking, and I had to take the lid off and move the arm to get it to spin up. Come to find out, I had figured out, which now the whole internet knows about it because the word's been spread, you know, and there's no problem with that. There's a rubber home position stopper in here that gets stuck now i've seen two versions of these drives the rubber bumper is up here by the actuator magnets which is easy to get to and there's the 80 megabyte drives which put them under the platter so you had and luckily it's a single platter so you have to remove the platter you have to remove the actuator arm protect the heads from smacking together so you don't get a cylinder misalignment and then remove the platter replace the rubber bumper and put it all back together again i've already done this with one 80 megabyte drive and the other 80 megabyte drive i wasn't careful enough with the heads and actually ruined the head so you cannot let the heads smack together the minute you do you'll cause lateral movement or you'll bend the spring so instead of the heads coming together like this they come together like this now or like that which will cause a cylinder misalignment and then it just it won't work ever again so anyway, it's a, it's apparently, it's well, it's pretty apparent that this thing is low hours because usually when these things are high hours, the glue on the flyback starts to turn a pretty poor brown. 
and that's pretty much yellow. It's starting to turn brown a little bit down in there from a, from being caged in with the heat. So it's got some hours on it, but not nearly as much as I've seen it. The other telltale sign is this connector here is not turning brown from bad connections. So that's a plus. And the, let's inspect the cathode on the CRT. Easy way by doing that is pulling the neck board off like such. You know, clean the back of the CRT out. And let's inspect the cathode and see if we can get down in there. I don't know if my camera will focus in that far. It doesn't look like it will. So, no, it will not focus in that far. But, yeah, I don't really see any bluing in the cathode. No, not at all. So, yeah, I don't see any bluing whatsoever. So, I think we're all right there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave this off because I want to pull this board out anyway. And... The other thing to check for is this capacitor right here. This guy couples the horizontal yoke winding to the horizontal circuit. It goes through this capacitor. And back back in these days, I guess electrolytic was the only thing available, but any competent engineer these days wouldn't use an electrolytic in that circuit. They'd use a film cap like that one. So why they didn't why they chose not to use that there is beyond me, but film caps work the best. I see a little bit of hot glue on that regulator. Yeah, I have all the parts on hand to recap this thing. And so we're going to do a full recap of the analog board. And we're going to do a full recap of the power supply. And that is a Sony CR44. The schematics are available to that power supply if you wish to uh, take a look at those. They're online, they can be found anywhere. Uh, looks like it's made in the ninth week of 1989. This is a fairly early production run. Because I think the SC, when was the SC30 released? I don't recall. Let's see, Samsung CRT, of course. Samsung makes everything even then as they do now. Uh, 32nd week of 89. Uh, let's see. Copyright 1990, so it might be a late model, later model anyway. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to play this one by ear. Oh, the other thing we have to do too is the floppy disk drive mechanism has to be removed and the floppy disk drive has to be cleaned and relubricated. So, uh, we'll have a fully restored machine. Ooh, look at all this. Tin whiskers. See? I love that. Yep, must be stored. It must have come from a um, uh, close to the ocean environment. And even even the crazy thing about this too is, even the cardboard on the rear is still nice and bright white. Usually these turn yellow or brown by now. Yeah, it's it's not seen much use at all because even the fan is is a little dusty, but not. Not a whole lot, so we might have got we might have got a good one here. Anyway, I'll be back after I take all these boards out and everything out of here. Completely gut this thing. Actually, before we do that, I think we're going to focus our work on the logic board, just because I'm curious if this logic board is even going to function properly. So let's see. I think the first thing we're going to do is. I'm going to remove that because it's pretty much garbage. I want to remove that. And the way we're going to do that to, to prevent damage is first things first, we have to take some of this flux here. Doesn't matter what you use. I just like this stuff. Uh, it's the SMD 291 chip quick. And I like this stuff because I used it in the Xbox repair days back when that was a thing. It may still be a thing, but not anymore for me. So what we're going to do is we are going to soak the pins in flux, which will make the solder much easier to reflow and absorb. This side might be a little more difficult because of the damage, but it shouldn't be too awful bad. Now, most people would probably just hit it with a heat gun, and I've seen that, but I don't like that because, for one thing, it warps the board and starts to affect the chips and plastic around it. 
And two, I don't want to excessively overheat any nearby chips that can cause problems. So we're just going to use our trusty little soldering iron and do that the old fashioned way. And how this is going to work, since I don't have a tripod for this camera, I can't do this on camera. So the way this is going to work is we're going to basically reflow the fresh solder with the flux and create this big blob along here and here. And we're going to take the iron and we're going to alternate alternately. It'd be easier if you had dual irons, but I've only got one. So with a single iron, we're going to alternately heat both sides until we get it soft enough to be able to move this chip around. And then I want to pull this chip off and then we're going to actually take the desoldering braid and clean up the crap off the pads. And then we're going to take this chip and throw it away because I'm not going to reuse it. The next thing that has to be done is uh, this chip here. I got to figure out what, what there is to that. And the reason why this one's so bad is because it was leaking out of this capacitor right here. So it's, it's painfully obvious that that one has to go and that one has to go as well. The reason why I wanted to use flux, as you can see there, the flux, it turned a really bad brown because it absorbs all the corrosion and the capacitor electrolyte or cap goo, if you prefer. It absorbs all of that and it, and it leaves nice and shiny pins. So that should be able to reflow out of there without any problems at all. I can't get these pins to collect enough solder to do a blob. So what I think I'm going to do is take the heat gun and actually heat it from the bottom of the board not the top so we're going to heat it until this flux turns all bubbly and the solder begins to to tin or to reflow go into the reflow state then we're just going to pull this chip off and that's it we don't have to worry about it anymore that's all there is to it nice hot and steamy pulled all that off see all the nice brown corrosion and cap goo and all I did was just heat the board this way until it gave loose. You don't want to get the heat gun too close so you'll burn the hell out of the bottom of the circuit board. So that's all there is to it. Unfortunately, even though my best efforts were as good as I possibly get, the corrosion was so bad that there's no copper left in this section of the board. And you may, I don't know if you can or not, you may just be able to see the break here too. That dark spot in the copper is actually the break between that one. So we're going to need a wire here and we're going to need a wire here. So if we trace that guy out, it goes up to this ram somewhere. Probably one of these two pens. So we're definitely going to need two wires there. But it is what it is. Not a whole lot you can do about that in, in a situation like this because as time goes on, that's only going to get worse the longer these sit. Doesn't matter how many times you wash them in a dishwasher, you're you're not going to, it's, it's irreparable damage. Anyways, next thing I need to do is start going around and cleaning these up and double checking to make sure there's no broken traces there. See that one looks complete. Rub that off. Everything's good there. There may be a break right there. Which is that dark spot in the copper. So I'm going to have to clean that off and check it. And make sure that that's not actually broken. It doesn't appear that it is. But aside from, aside from the missing copper from the corrosion it doesn't look like i've ever done anything to that like there's a ch chip that was never there and that's because of using you know that you can probably use just acetone i mean it's not that big a deal but yeah i'm gonna pull a new chip out of my bag of capacitors over here and get this sucker put in there plus well actually before i do that i'm gonna go around and Inspect all the capacitor connections, clean them up the best I can, make sure the pads are salvageable, uh, and all that fun stuff. And there's some corrosion down in here. I need to make sure 
with some yeah there's definite corrosion down in there and I need to make sure that these guys are still connected to the circuit especially that one oh same over here this is how bad the corrosion was over here so if the internal speaker doesn't work that's probably why okay then all right now that's pretty much it oh one more thing i'm going to do while i'm thinking about it uh i'm going to remove this capacitor before it gives us any more of a problem can't see any leakage but it's hard to tell because there's no i, I washed the board same thing here we're going to remove that one and remove that one okay oh one more thing I noticed certain people that recap these boards, certain people that recap these boards, I've noticed that they tend to just tie off here and solder to these two points, which I don't think there's a problem with that, but I don't, I, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. These pins are very hard to pull out because they're actually connected to the internal copper planes. This one is connected to the ground plane. That one is connected with an in-circuit in trace. There, there's, there's a trace on the bottom, but there's also a trace on the third layer that runs from this pin over to this one. So that, and then people rip these, these uh, plating, through hole platings out all the time. So the best way to handle these is to add fresh solder, flux, et cetera, et cetera. Preheat the board with a heat gun while you're pulling these out and using the Heiko to desolder or solder braid if you prefer to desolder these pens and then you won't have any problems. So just food for thought. So when cleaning these pads, like I'm doing here, you can see where some of the copper is gone. Be very, very careful because the capacitor electrolyte has sat here and corroded for so long that these uh, pads want to come off. Like this one here just let loose on me. And it is just an unfortunate side effect for letting these sit too long. So just be very, very careful. Chances are this isn't the only one that's going to want to lift off. I'm going to have a bunch of them over here with the same issue. So um, just think about that when restoring one of these machines. That's why I can't emphasize enough that if you're going to do just the dishwasher trick and leave it alone, this is what you're gonna end up with if you don't get to it right away. Also, there are multitudes of different ways to clean these pads up, but the way that I do it is I use, again, a little bit of this flux. I add fresh solder and move the tip back and forth a little bit to just to kind of get it in there. Then I go behind it with the desoldering braid and just using a lateral motion, I remove the old solder and again you got to be careful because you don't want to rip the pad off but you can kind of get it I'm sure there's many different ways to do it you can use a Dremel if you so desire if you've got a very steady hand but I don't recommend using a Dremel because you just kind of run off and do a bunch of other damage to the board that's unnecessary but to each their own there's many different ways to do this but that's the way that I found and it seems to be the most effective for me is using the flux solder and solder braid method to clean all the crap up and then go back behind it with some flux remover. This is after a douse of flux remover, PCB cleaner. And they're all clean except there's some crap left on this one which I need to get back to and go over it again. And also this allows me to go through and make sure that there's no broken connections between here and here and you can see where the copper's gone. So, and I, this pad actually connects over to this point here. So I need to check it with a multimeter and make sure that's good. Same thing with there. And then every one of these really, just as you're doing these, just make sure that the verify the electrical connections, and if they're broken, make note of it. And that way, after you put all the new caps in, you can make the appropriate jumper wires, which is what I'm going to do. So I already know I need two over here. And I got to go back to the multimeter and check all these to make sure I don't need any there. And if I do, you know, etc. Or if you rip the pad off, you're definitely going to need a jumper wire. 
Uh, my case is if you do rip one of these off, it's not the end of the world. Just tack it to the opposite pad if there's one left and use some glue to knock it so it can't move around and run the jumper wire to the appropriate location. Where that location is, you ask? Well, the easiest thing to do is to follow a schematic, okay? Or um, if you don't have a schematic, there are some resources online of other machines where people want to know where the tie points are for the electrical circuitry. But before you start ripping pads off, that's another thing you can do is meter this to figure out where they go beforehand. Just make a mental note. There's there's many different ways to do this, but since this is the SC30, the schematics are available online. So if you lose one of these pads, it's not the end of the world. Another tip when you're cleaning these off with a solder braid or rotary tool or anything else, make sure not to snag any uh, traces that run nearby, like this one and these. Because if you do and you snag the solder mask and you go to solder the new capacitors in place, if you're not careful, the solder may jump over and hit the next trace or two and then you short everything out and then that's not going to be a good day for you, trust me. Uh, I've worked on many boards where people have accidentally done that. And they, they recover okay, but I've only had one that I couldn't fix after the fact. It did some pretty good damage. So just keep that in mind when you're reworking these. So I'm gonna go ahead and rework all the rest of them and I'll be back after I get those cleaned out so I can show you how to remove these. Hey then, here's the next thing we're gonna do. Now that we have everything cleaned up as best as we possibly can, as you probably noticed right away here that there's some of the pads are just completely eaten away, but they got continuity so we're good. The only other concern I have is down here and that's because there's a trace right here that looks pretty darn bad which is probably why the machine wasn't booting at all so i'll have to take a look at that later but for now what i want to focus on is removing these legs and the easiest way to do that in my opinion and my opinion seems to be good in this case is we are going to basically flux the connections as soon as I can figure out where it is here's one flux that one all right and here's the other one I'm gonna do the same thing to this one too okay and the next step is to heat the board up with the heat gun down here and I have the Heiko warming up so, without further ado, get this guy warmed and we'll be rocking and rolling. Be right back. A lot more difficult than it should have been because the pads were corroded from the same capacitor goo, but I managed to get it out without destroying anything. side of the board and there's the joint at which the capacitor was grounded and there's the one that I pulled out of there and then there's these two and I've managed to avoid damaging any traces which is another common thing that I see with these and that's it the next thing is to recap it and that process I will save until after I cap it all and then I'll film it recapped because I can't do a time lapse anyway got it all finished you can barely tell I've even worked on it just barely <laughs> all right so now that the capacitors are all in place everything appears to be good in that front so we're gonna we're going to power it on to see if we even get a chime or anything of such regard so the first thing I'm gonna do is put the ROM sim in before I put the RAM in. And I'm gonna fire it up just on the ROM sim. Wow, this thing's tight. It's almost as if it's never been apart before. Which is quite possible. All right, now, power. Hey, how about that?
So now the next step is we're pulling one and a half amps on the five volt rail and jelly beans on the 12 volt rail. You have to have a 12 volt rail when testing these machines. There's no other way to get around that because the 12 volt rail is used to power this sound circuit over here. Well, if you can be like, well, why don't you just power it up on five volts? You don't need the sound right now. Oh yes I do, because not only does the Sony sound chip control the sound, it also controls the reset line for the whole system. So if that Sony chip doesn't get power, it never comes out of reset. So uh, Mac no boot. Let's try it again, shall we? Hey, what do you know, we got a chime. So step two, is to pull out that machine there, even though that one's not restored yet. We'll just go ahead and hook it all up just to see if we get video and if we can get SCSI boot or any of that fun stuff. Don't try this at home, folks. Will that cable even reach up there? No, it won't. Ooh, I'm gonna be careful. I'm gonna be very, very careful. All right, next thing I wanna do is put the power cord in the power supply all right hey how about that you've seen it here folks it's the first time I fired up the logic board since I put all new caps in it Alrighty then, so step one is complete. I think I'll leave it off right now for now and I will pick this back up in another installment because this is a very, very uh, lengthy project here. So logic board is recapped, logic board is functioning. So the next step is to strip this mess down and start laying out the capacitors and recapping all of that fun stuff so until next time thank you for watching if you have a comment please feel free to leave one